like Sparks are until now the most influential and greatest band to not have a music documentary about them. <laughs> I'm Charlie Harding. I'm the co-host of the Vox Media podcast, Switched on Pop, about the making and meaning of popular music. And today I'm joined by brothers Ron and Russell Mayle of the band Sparks and filmmaker Edgar Wright and director of the documentary, The Sparks Brothers. Thank you all for joining me in conversation. Thank you. Edgar, I'm going to start with an impossible question. Who are Sparks and what led you to want to make a documentary doc, a documentary about their musical career? I can answer both parts of the question in one. Like Sparks are, until now, the most influential and greatest band to not have a music documentary about them. <laughs> and I, I figured after like a long time of being an evangelist for the band and uh, probably like chewing my friend's ears off about like if they didn't know Sparks, how they should know Sparks. And uh, I got it into my head that like the thing that was stopping them from being as 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 uh, as well known as they should be was some kind of like overview that would explain the story of Sparks and their context and how they were always like way ahead of the curve. And I think at a certain point of like just saying that like one of my friends finally called me on it at a Sparks gig no less in 2017, uh, I was in LA and me and Phil Lord went to see Sparks. And I, I said the same thing to him. I said, you know what, Sparks really should have a documentary about them. I think that would really like push it over the edge and just kind of like people would understand how amazing they are. And Phil just said, you should do that movie. And I was like, okay, I will. And then after the gig backstage, I, I told Ron and Russell about this idea. And as soon as I'd said it out loud, it was like a verbal promise that I could not um, break. And so here we are in 2021 with the finished film. Yeah, Ron Russell, Sparks, you know, maintains a, a fair amount of intrigue and mystique, even with such a storied career, 26-ish albums, I think is correct. If I... Musically, you've really avoided repeating or canonizing your work. How did it feel to be profiled in such depth? Well, that was, that was kind of the reluctance that we always had to having any documentary made that, that you know, just that we didn't want things to be kind of pinpointed too too much but then when when Edgar approached I mean both because you know we had such an appreciation for for his films and that we knew that stylistically the documentary would be kind of more than just a documentary uh, but also that his passion for the band that we felt this was the right you know the right time to to have have the documentary made if we were ever going to have one made I and mean, we've We've, we've declined, uh, you know, quite a few other directors just that wanted to make a documentary, but, but this, this was really a different situation. Edgar, your film portrays the eclectic musicality of Sparks with a sort of barrage of visual styles. You have very witty texts flying onto the screen, intimate interviews done in black and white styles, archival film, of course, you have absurdist cartoons and collage. I'm curious, what challenges did you encounter trying to build that visual language that could match the eclecticism of a band like Sparks? Well, I, I think sort of that, I, I tried to sort of approach it in the same, with the same sort of visual wit as Ron and Russell had, because, you know, not just in terms of their appearance, but like sort of in their videos, but obviously the album covers is like something that's like a really key kind of like element to sort of what makes Sparks tick. And and then I think also in kind of like hearing the story, like one of the things that was the most kind of like illuminating to me was like um, the, the, the context of like what they were into before they started making music. And that was really fascinating to me, not just like the, 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 the music that they got into, but also um, the films and even how they watched the films. And so I, I felt like there was a lot of um, like sort of just imagery through that. So I felt like I could continue through the movie is the way of like showing all of Sparks' influences in kind of art and kind of um, film and music throughout the whole documentary. So I, I guess that was, it was, a, it just came organically out of the interviews in a way especially like there's just a one little anecdote early on in the film when Ron and Russell talk about going to see double bills with their dad and coming in at the wrong time and having this kind of fractured sense of like the films they were watching. And even just the idea of like the, 
the commercials and all of the kind of like just this sort of barrage of pop culture that just seemed to me a way of like telling the story um, throughout. So it was it was it was such a kind of gift in a way to do a film about such not just a band that are like so brilliant musically, but are such a visual band as well. It, it seems like an appropriate metaphor because Sparks have had so many fandoms of so many different generations who join the band in media's race. You're kind of, you got to jump in. There's a whole world of material and whether you found the sort of new wave sounds compelling or the sort of punk turn, or maybe they're from the very beginning, uh, you're kind of always constantly rediscovering, kind of like stepping into the film in the middle. Uh, I love, uh, you were talking about the sort of um, creative spark. Sorry for the terrible pun. I'm sure that's happened about a million times in your career. Um, but you talked about uh, film being so influential in, in, in terms of your sensibility as musicians. And you, you both talk a lot about the sort of rebellious nature. In fact, uh, Russell, I believe in the film, you say that your nature is just rebellious and provocative. Could you speak more to how that rebellious and provocative nature developed for you and maybe how it's changed over the years? Well, I think, I think it's rebellious and provocative um, kind of against the status quo, you know, of things, because you can be provocative. Um, not the band status quo, right? <laughs> not the band no. status quo, <laughs> which that's another story we'll, we can tell you about, but uh, not you know, to be going against the grain musically and what you are, what you represent as a, as a band, as opposed to, you know, sloganeering and uh, being uh, politically, um, you know, provocative in that sort of way. I think that what we are is provocative and our, the whole stance of the band is provocative in a certain way and that it, that it goes um, counter to a lot of what's happening in pop music and what's happened throughout all of you know pop music and i think that's that's the thing because sometimes people misunderstand maybe that what the provocation is and what the rebelliousness but we're kind of rebelling against the status quo of just doing things in the same way that they've always been done you know you're you're given an opportunity within pop music there's sort of certain givens that are there you can push those even but you know there's three, pop music, three and a half minute songs and You've got to tell it within that that context. So how can you kind of in this day and age when pop music is, you know, how old is pop music? Uh, you know, now it's, you know, seven, 70 years old or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, you know, how do you how do you do it in fresh new ways? And especially for a band like us that has a long history with 25 albums to not kind of be recycling what you've done on your first album and to. And, and so that's something that I think that we're really proud of is that we're always kind of trying to challenge ourselves and challenge the conventions that are there within pop music and to not be lazy about that and say, well, just, you know, do another song that's okay with a good verse and a good chorus that try to, within those certain confines of pop music, to try to find ways to push through and both both musically and lyrically too, to have lyrics that aren't that are provocative in the sense that they're you know not you can have a song a love song but finding a fresh way to to treat that love song that's not sort of a hackneyed cliched um lyric that you've heard before ron you, you say in the film that uh i love this you say if you don't like it we don't care that's the <laughs> essence of what popular music should be can you tell me more about that essence of popular music? There seems to be a contradiction in your statement, right? We don't care if you like it, and yet it's popular music. I, I, no, that, that, that the contradictions are kind of what really fascinates me about pop music, where you're operating within a very kind of basically corporate kind of uh, atmosphere, but you're doing something that, at least from your own uh, feelings, is an artistic statement and so trying to get away with as much as you can within those confines is is the thing that that uh you know if, if i look at it from the outside and you know, I, I try to be kind of focused in what we're doing but if i try to analyze it as an outsider 
it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a pretty uh, amazing situation that, you know, we're, we're popular musicians in the sense of working within, you know, this kind of music, but then you also have kind of uh, artistic ambitions and how those kind of two things uh, conflict with each other, that kind of friction, I think it is kind of the basis of, uh, you know, what, what I think every uh, great band is, is about that, you know, working both within and then, you know, with, without in a, in a, in a certain sense. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, and, and also I, and there is a certain hypocritical uh, side to that, the, the statement I made, because, you know, give, given a preference of more people liking you or less, I would, I would definitely take more because you want to impose your sensibility on, on, on more, more people. But as an attitude thing, I think it's important to have the attitude that that you feel that other that it doesn't matter what other people think about what you do. Yeah, Edgar, for the film, you you drummed up uh, an incredible group of people who are deep Sparks fans, and I mean incredible people because they're some of the most influential people in culture. Everything from sci-fi author Neil Gaiman to m many musicians, uh, Beck, Bjork, uh, producer Jack Antonoff. Uh, there's uh, comedians. The list at the end of the title cards or at the end of the credits is amazing about the number of contributors. I'm curious what it was like for you to go and drum up all of these people who have been so deeply influenced in their art. What was the process of you finding all of these folks and how did how was it for you to, to get to share in your own uh, love of Sparks with these folks? Well, it sounds like the last bit first. I mean, it was it was easy doing the interviews in the sense that uh, your two fellow Sparks fans so when I'm interviewing Duran Duran, like I'm not interviewing, you know, like John Taylor and Nick Rhodes about Duran Duran. We're just sitting around talking about how much we love Sparks, which with with a band that like uh, that iconic is just a funny thing in its own right and, and very sweet. And it was it, it was kind of an interesting thing to sort of reduce, not reduce, but like all of these uh, uh, a level playing field where all of these people are like now fanboys. We're just, I'm sitting around with Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols just talking about Sparks or like Stephen Morris and Gillian Gilbert from New Order and Stephen Morris from Joy Division just talking about Sparks. So that was really like sort of like a lovely thing to do. And then I think in terms of how do we get them all together is that between like sort of myself and Ron Russell, we, we sort of had a list of people that we knew were like noted Sparks fans in that they had gone on record as saying that they were a fan of the band. And that was certainly true of like you know, Bjork or, or um, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, Duran Duran or like sort of Vince Clark, you know. And then there are other people, and this is the more funny thing about it, that I just assumed that they were Sparks fans. <laughs> and nine out of 10 times I was correct. And so those people I just approached, like, I mean, I knew, I knew them all already. But like people like Neil Gaiman or Mike Myers or Beck or Flea or Fred Armisen or Scott Ackerman or Pat on Oswald, it's almost like a Freemasons thing. You just like go, you're a Sparks fan, right? Oh, I love Sparks. And then you start talking about Sparks and saying, I want you to say exactly what you said to me on camera. So literally, like I was actually, I think I was meeting or talking to Mike Myers about something else and said, hey, do you know the band Sparks? He goes, I love Sparks. He goes, girl from Germany, I used to play a cover of that. And I was like, okay, you're gonna be in my documentary, he goes. And so nobody really needed to have their arm twisted to be in it. It was more, and this is where my producers did an amazing job, it's more like a feat of scheduling. Because then also, as you can see in the, in the documentary, I wanted everybody to be shot in the same way. So it's not like people can like knock off a quick interview on their iPhones. I had to get everybody to the studio. And as such, we did interviews over, probably about a period of a year or more, maybe New York, London, LA, over several different trips to get 80 <laughs> like interviewees. And that was amazing. And then beyond that, there's all the people that Ron and Russell worked with. Very happily, all of those people are still with us. So to actually be able to interview every single producer that they worked with, Todd Rundgren, Muff Winwood, Jim Lowe, Georgia Moroda, Tony Visconti, that was just amazing. So I think once the kind of the 
I got the sense that people were very keen to talk, then it really just became like an oral history. And like, uh, you know, I, I think it was something where I, you know, if we didn't have to finish the film, I'd probably still be doing interviews now. <laughs> <laughs> Those interviews are great fun because they do have um, almost like an Errol Morris seriousness in the way that they're filmed. And yet they're so playful because you can feel the joy in all of these, you know, incredible people who are known in their own right, their, their fandom and appreciation and influence from Sparks. And I, of course, enjoyed that. Uh, you know, all their title cards have wonderful jokes. You know, when we get to, when we get the members of Duran Duran, we get Duran and Duran. So there's, there's, you get the seriousness and the humor, just like we get in, in Sparks music. You know, it's also a Herculean task that I think you took on in terms of just the number of people that you brought in and also the, just the, the desire to go through an entire catalog that is, it has such depth to it. And, uh, you know, Sparks, you all have, uh, you, you have taken on such large tasks of playing your entire body of music, which is a, a feat of human memory. Um, you are as, as, at 25 studio albums plus a, a, a collaboration album near, you know, 300-ish songs. You're into seven decades of music. There's just so much reinvention. You know, one of the things I'm curious about is how you all build habits and rituals to maintain your own great shape of physicality, spirituality, musicality, creativity, Again, I'm really sorry for the pun, but like what, how do you maintain that creative spark? How, what, what do you all do to do it? Well, one thing is, you know, we really have such respect for pop music that we don't feel, feel that it's at all an inferior genre to any other. I mean, I, I listen to all kinds of music. I miss, listen to, you know, jazz and classical things, in particular modern classical things. But, but we don't feel that, that popular music is a, you know, a lesser uh, musical force. And, and so we really feel that, that it's important to, to be respectful of that and, and to, to not do crap when you're making uh, music. And, and so, you know, and, and, you know, we we're really fortunate because at this point, a lot of musicians that maybe started off working within rock pop or rock music however you want to refer to it might feel that they're kind of slumming when they're when they're doing the the music that we do now but we 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 never do we can do it from you know real real passion that that this is this is the kind of music that we like we're not distanced from it at all we're not making music for the kids you know i mean if there are a lot of young people that are responding to what we're doing now but, but it isn't that we feel that we're distanced from our audience at all, which, you know, I, I know that there's some level of uh, self-delusion involved with that, but that, that's kind of a part of, of the process. So, you know, we're, we're really fortunate that we can kind of do what we're doing now in, a, in, in an, honest, an honest way and, and try to maintain the, the level of quality uh, to what we're doing, uh, you know, we, we can kind of never understand when when there are songs coming out by other people that um, were, you know, it just seems like, say, there's a strong musical statement, but there isn't kind of like any kind of care taken with the lyrics. And the, those sorts of things kind of are bothering to us because we feel that that so much respect should be paid to every single song that every single song really matters first of all you one of the things i really appreciated in watching this was the the evolution of just recording and at a certain point in your career for much for the early part of the career and much even the middle of it you all had to, to a certain degree ask for permission to record recording equipment is expensive you had to get into studios you needed supportive labels um you all now record together side by side in a home studio, like so many people do. And I'm curious, how do you, do you find it increasingly liberating to be able to have uh, complete control over that creative process? Does it feel different today than it did when you started? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we think there's no downside at all to, uh, well, modern technology allowing people to have, you know, uh, studios in their home and to be able to, to do quality recordings, you know, on a, you know, on more limited 
budget, we don't, there's no, no downside to that from our standpoint. We even get nervous when we have to do a project where we have to go into a professional uh, recording studio. Um, and we even did, when we did the FFS album, the collaboration with Franz Ferdinand, we did it a really high priced London studio, Rack Studios. And for us going in there, it's like after working at home for so long, we kind of go, well, there's people watching us and they're, they're, uh, they're listening to what we're doing. And we, you know, we, we're not used to that and we're, we're intimidated by that. And I think it's really liberating to have your own studio at your own place where you can, you can just do any idea you want. And if it's a, if it's stupid, then, then no one else knows about it. And you, you just, you move on and you can take as long as you want to do anything. And we think it, you know, we think it's completely uh, liberating. You know, we, the, we also learn from really great producers. You know, we, we, we listened a lot when we were, you know, working with Tony Visconti. He's a, he's a, a master. He's not only a incredible musician that a lot of people don't know about, but he's also a technician as well. And he's got, we think, really great taste just based on the artist he's produced. And so, you know, we paid attention to him when we were in the studio through various projects we've done with Tony, you know, and pick up things. And, you know, Giorgio Moroder, we learned things, Todd Rundgren, Muff Winwood, um, you know, you, you, you learn things. And at a certain point, you, you feel that you have the ability to kind of be a good, a better judge about your own music when you're re recording and to not do things that are just, uh, you're going off on your own and maybe you should have the guidance of somebody sitting there all the time. But at a certain point, we've, we've felt that we've kind of maybe earned the right a little, to be able to, um, you know, be our own, uh, be our own destiny a certain way, our own masters and to, but we we're pretty, we're pretty good. We think at judging uh, what we're doing now and, and, you know, we probably wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, what making the documentary, I think one of our biggest fears, it wasn't, uh, revealing anything of a personal nature was more for people to actually see our recording system because you know to maybe to a casual person it looks kind of underwhelming but we you know it is it isn't like going to abbey road studios with all kinds of of uh dials and meters and everything but but we we know anyway that that the same kind of results can be achieved that way so we we were but we we're worried that when people see, uh, is that all it is? You know, it, that 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 maybe they would kind of think less of of what you're doing musically. They have better as, coffee as lounges. The, as the observer here, like I, I say, that makes it even more impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <Absolutely>. Thank you, <laughs> Edgar. What do you hope this uh, will do for the music? This film. What do you hope it will do, will do for the music? Well, I just think it's nice. Like, I mean. I'm sort of as excited for fans, uh, for like virgins who've never heard Sparks before to hear it as, as the fans in a way, like to watch the movie rather, because I think the, the response I've had from people who don't know Sparks at all, uh, that are like music fans or just, uh, they're kind of sort of staggered by it because it sort of fills in like a missing chapter in, in their knowledge. And especially in terms of where you've, heard the bands that like have been influenced by Sparks, but not kind of heard the sort of the, you know, the kind of like the the the, the, the ground zero where it all comes from. I think sort of a lot of people have been sort of quite confounded about it where they sort of think, oh, wow, I see. I mean, there's a thing Jack Antonoff says it in the documentary is that he, you know, he came upon Sparks because he heard a Sparks song and he said, oh, they kind of sound like Depeche Mode, huh? 1979, that's two years before Depeche Mode. <laughs> like, or like, oh, it sounds a bit like Queen. Oh wait, this single was before Bohemian Rhapsody. So there's a lot of things like that where I think people are kind of feel in the best way possible, like schooled by it a little bit in terms of like, wow, I did not know that. And I, I, so for me, it's like the documentary is both a celebration and an introduction. So I tried to sort of like make something which anybody could enjoy, whatever your knowledge of sparks is yeah from what i can tell from uh other public material about sparks you really uh, as i said earlier have uh, not been compelled towards any canonization you all are 
constantly moving forward, right? There are so many years where you've just an album, 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 year after year, and, and you're continuing to move forward. I'm, I'm curious for Sparks, what's what's going on next? You've, you're going to continue some foray into film, I hear. Yeah, well, we, we have a, a film project that's coming out this year, a um, project that we wrote eight years ago, uh, a movie musical, and... Um, now eight years later, it's coming. It's it, it has been. It's finished. It'll be out later in the year. So, uh, tip, in typical Sparks fashion, we have uh, two movies out in in one year. But, you know, it never rains but it pours. So, uh, um, and it's it's a movie called Annette that we that is directed by the French director Leos Carax, and it's um, it's a full blown musical, very unconventional musical in certain ways both story-wise and also musically um, in fitting with Tone of Sparks and um, it is starring Adam Driver and Marianne Cotillard so that's coming out later in the year and we're really you know happy about that as well that um, it puts what we do musically in kind of another context too so people can you know be able to see that that we work in in one way with Sparks albums, but we also can work in a, in another way that's a, a narrative form and 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 has other lesser you know other restrictions and other kind of uh, guidelines and 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 concerns when you work in in that way. So that's that's coming out later that this year. We're also working on you know new material always for the next next sparks album and we have you know we have an, uh you know another idea for another movie musical project too so we're uh we're moving on yeah leave it to sparks to have both a documentary and a musical in the same year very exciting <laughs> um there are many misconceptions about sparks and i'd like to uh leave with a question for all of you uh briefly and you can answer uh truthfully or in any way that you want what is the greatest misconception about sparks well, I'll start with Ron. That what we do is tongue in cheek. <laughs> Edgar? I think probably it's covered in the documentary that a large portion of people think that Sparks are a British band. Whereas I hope that this documentary like finally gives them the um, you know, the the title of being like sort of LA rock royalty. <laughs> and Russell, you get the last word. Oh god. Um well, maybe maybe it's all the the yeah the the maybe we discussed it earlier. I'm not sure, but just uh, you know that oh Sparks the synth pop band Sparks oh Sparks the uh, neoclassical uh, baroque pop band oh Sparks the glam band oh Sparks the uh, you know chamber pop oh Sparks the disco band you know that that were you know probably none of those that were you know that any kind of categories that are so specific should be tossed aside and it's kind of uh all of those and none of those break the algorithm break the algorithm <laughs> man gentlemen it's been such a pleasure the documentary is the sparks brothers ron russell edgar thank you so much for joining me it has been an absolute pleasure good talking with you thank, thank you, you.